The 2024 primary race for governor appears to be taking shape in its early stages. The infancy so far, State Senator Bill Eigel wants the job, and he's started launching digital attack ads, taking aim at Secretary of State Jay Ashcroft and at Lieutenant Governor Mike Kehoe. What, what kind of a more. governor would Mike Kehoe make? He'd be good. I mean, I put him a lieutenant governor. I got confidence in him to be a statewide candidate. And, you know, every person I did that I put in a statewide position, five of them, in this, which has never been done before in our state's history, but all of them have got a pretty good proven track record of moving forward. So we'll see how that goes up. You know, we'll let the election, let the people decide that. But, Are you going to endorse him? All right, let's yeah, go. Yeah, I'm simple on that. And Missouri's Secretary of State, Jay Ashcroft, joins us on the record now. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Not quite a full endorsement from Governor Parson for his Lieutenant Governor, uh, Mike Kehoe there. What kind of a governor do you think Mike Kehoe would make? You know, I, I think that the people of the state will make a great decision. And if they choose Mike Kehoe, I, I think he'll lead the state in a good direction. Uh, are you hoping they'll choose you instead? You know, I am just going to trust the people of the state right now. I'm focused on doing a good job for them. I have a full-time job working on legislation. I'm going to do what needs to be done, and we'll see what happens. You haven't officially declared that you're running for governor yet. A lot of people think that you might be, and the consultants seem to be lining up in that direction and all of that. You want to break any news on the program here? I don't. I think it's more important that we have elected officials that are worried about their current job than they are about their next job. You talked about the legislation you're working on. You're supporting right now a bill that would uh, restrict foreign businesses or persons from owning more than one-half of one percent of all the acreage, all the farmland in Missouri. Right now, foreign companies can buy up to one percent of all the farmland in Missouri. Most Republicans supported that plan when it passed, including Lieutenant Governor Kehoe. Where were you on the record? Were you vocally opposing this? At the time? I wasn't an elected official at the time. No, but um, you have opinions. That was in 2013, so I was working as an attorney. And to, I, I have to admit, I probably didn't even know when they took that vote at the time. When did it occur to you, wait a minute, this might be a threat, China might be a threat, you know, the biggest turning point for me, uh, I think we've seen that China is becoming more and more of a threat. But during COVID, when we saw that there were st uh, grocery store shelves that were running out of meat and we saw meat that was being shipped overseas, um, it seems, you know, I think uh, China really shipped COVID here by allowing travel to the United States, but not within their country. And they shipped our meat and our food to China. That's a problem. You uh, called for, recently, when the House was being sworn in, this new legislative session, you spoke. Uh, you delivered a speech before the House there, and you called for a constitutional amendment that would require voters to approve any general tax increase. But the voters elect legislators to make those decisions. Why would a legislator, <laughs> why would, why would a legislator tie their own hands? Um, I'm not sure the legislators will. I think the only will to do that is if the people get active and get involved. But I think if you ask the, the random person on the street, they'll tell you they don't think their legislators are doing the right job and that Missouri isn't doing as well as it could be doing. Lieutenant Governor Kehoe sponsored a sales tax increase in 2014 that would have gone to fund roads and bridges. Uh, would you have voted for that? Uh, no, we didn't need that. Uh, I was a vocal, one of the main vocal proponents against the gas tax that just came up a couple of years ago. We had $2 billion sitting in the bank. We didn't know what to do with it. I said there's no reason to raise taxes when we have money. We don't know how to spend it. Now we raise those taxes and we have an even greater surplus. We need to let the people be in control of how their money is spent. All right, we're talking public dollars. Let's talk private dollars for a minute. Has Wall Street gone woke? Um, I think there are a lot of concerns that investors are being misled about what's being done with their, their dollars. We put out an anti-ESG rule, which is really not anti-ESG, it's anti-fraud. We believe an investment advisor should let you know what your investments are going to, and if they're making it ad advice, it should be for the best financial return. This is like the newest buzzword on Capitol Hill as Republicans look for ways to beat up President Biden, his Labor Department, about ESG, that acronym for folks who might not know at home, for environmental, social, and corporate governance principles, ESG. Uh, back to that bill you were talking about, uh, that you call it anti-ESG or anti-fraud. I want to dig into the specifics there. Yeah. You, you recently said in a, that press release that financial advisors should be, quote, purely focused on generating profit for their clients. Should they also focus on avoiding risk in their client's portfolio? Uh, what I think they should do is they should be responsive to their client. And under that rule that we put out and under the legislation, if the client wants them 
to take into account ESG in some way, they're allowed to do that. But they shouldn't mislead them. People expect when they go to an advisor, they're going to advise them on the best return. We just want to make sure people know what they're getting. A lot of uh, big corporate investors, big money managers for 20 years uh, have talked about investing with a conscience, investing in things that are sustainable. What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that if they disclose that to the individual they're selling the security to. It's about the people knowing what they're buying and making their own informed decision. Uh, in investment decisions, you're often looking not just for profit alone, but also in, av in avoiding risk. In investments always take on some risk. That's part of the game. It's part of the disclosure that right. you read. Uh, some investors are more comfortable with risk. Some are less, they're more risk averse. Uh, is there no risk at all in fossil fuels? I think there's risk in every possible investment. And because of that, because of the differences in risks and the differences in risk tolerances, every investment advisor has to talk to their client to figure out what sort of risk they want to have and get their approval. They should do the same thing for social goals. You'd agree, though, that the First Amendment uh, provides people with their right to freely speak, to freely spend, and to freely associate with companies or ideas they believe in, right? Yes, if they want to do that, they may. Why would the government put up stop signs in front of that? All we're doing is making sure, as has been done for longer than I've been alive, we're requiring people that are selling you an investment to disclose what exactly they're doing, what exactly you're buying, like a and why label. they're giving it to you. It's just like we do on anything else. Like a warning label? I think people ought to be told the truth. Do you think they should be lied to? Well, no, of course not. Well, I we don't want people being misled. We believe that it's a material fact whether or not you're suggesting an investment because it, you think it will get the best financial return or because you want to get your client to invest in something that you support when they may not. Your, your press release said that some of these different issues about around ESG are non-pecuniary. You want to offer a definition? Well, the idea have... there is you're invest, you may invest in something and you don't want to get the best return financially because you're trying to do something. You could have people, it's ESG, you could have people that want to do an investment that will give them some return, but part of the money will go to their church or some faith that they believe in. That's fine. We just believe that the investors should make that decision and that they should be fully informed when they make that. But if someone's investing in a, more, a, a cleaner environment, uh, less pollution, I don't know that it's non-pecuniary, really, is it? I mean, you can quantify the harm. That You know who measures risk are, are uh, uh, global reinsurance companies. The mm -hmm. second largest global reinsurance company on the planet measured the risk of fossil fuels. They said that the world stands to lose around 10% of the total economic value because of the effects of climate change. We're talking a massive global recession. One more study from Harvard, in fact, found that uh, more than 8 million people died in 2018 alone from fossil fuel pollution. So it seems you can quantify. And I believe that people should be able to make their own individual decision. If they want to go with that sort of a study, they're allowed to do that. If they want to disagree with it and make sure their money is invested differently, that should be their decision. I'm picking on that word non-pecuniary. I don't know that. Well, that was for financial return. Right. Well, there, there's a financial impact on 8 million people dying. But that's not the financial impact to the investor. And what those is, numbers, those, those numbers are very hypothetical, and I, well. You, if, you would call them into question? Yes. <laughs> politely. I, pol politely, <laughs> I see. Uh, what, what is this larger, uh, is it a political push? Uh, it's seen, th this woke ideology is this new buzzword we hear in, in Republican political circles. That there's like a well, no, we're hearing that ideology coming from Democrats that are trying to impose that on other people. Impose. It's not a new thing that our office has tried to push back and make sure that the people of Missouri would know what they're investing in. We've been pushing back at the national level when we've been writing letters uh, to the organizations involved in the securities industry to say, this is what we think should be done to make sure that the mm -hmm. people of the state have disclosure. I guess, so you, you used the word fraud early on in this. Do you think there are real victims here? Do you think there are people, uh, in, investors in the state if of Missouri you're told who are right the, now being hoodwinked? If, if you are investing your money so that you can have a, a big anniversary in 20 years or something and you're expecting the best financial return and instead you're getting half of that return so your money can be invested in something that your investment advisor likes, yes, that's fraudulent. That's been the law. It's a material fact. It needs to be disclosed. And that's a problem that exists that brought you to this solution. Um, any time a material fact is not disclosed, that is fraudulent per the law, has been the law, we want to make sure not only if it is happening that it stops, but that it doesn't happen in the future. I see. Uh, and you talked about, I want to go back to that tax amendment earlier. Yeah. Missouri has a 
graduated income tax structure, technically, does it? Yes. Senator Josh Hawley has said that the Missouri Republican Party and Republicans more broadly need to focus more on the middle class, the working class, people who are trying to just create a little more breathing room in their budgets. Would you support the exploration of an idea to cut taxes for people who are in the middle class in that graduated structure? I want to cut taxes for everybody. I don't want to pick winners and losers. I don't want to pit some people against other people. I believe government is about serving all people, and I want the lowest possible tax burden on all Missourians. Well, do you prefer a flat tax in, in essence, or a one that is that, that doesn't take so much of the disposable income from a person in the working class? I'm happy to push for any uh, change in taxes that will lower the tax burden on all Missourians. I don't care if you do that through the income tax. I don't care if you do that through sales tax. I want the people of Missouri to have more of their own money to spend. Secretary Ashcroft, thank you for joining us.